The following program is made possible by Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo, the next stage. In the year 2000, a state ballot measure banning same-sex marriage passed 61% to 32%. In 2013, after a landmark Supreme Court decision, polling showed 64% of Californians favored same-sex marriage. What caused such a dramatic reversal of a once controversial issue? We talked to our friend Melissa Michelson about this sweeping change in public attitude. The game is public opinion. The game is on. Hi, I'm Kevin Mullen. And I'm Mark Simon. Welcome to the game. Most of the difficult issues facing this nation, gun control, abortion, race relations, the death penalty, are immovable. But public attitudes and acceptance of same-sex marriage underwent an amazing turnaround. In the year 2000, voters approved Prop 22, a ban on same-sex marriage, by a margin of 61% to 32%. In 2008, a similar measure, Proposition 8, also passed, but by a much narrower margin of 52 to 48 percent. By 2013, same-sex marriage was legal, and public polling showed 64 percent of Californians supported it. So what happens? That's exactly the question asked by political scientists Brian Harrison and Melissa Michelson. They set off to research why public opinion changed so dramatically and so swiftly. The results of their work have been published in Listen, We Need to Talk, How to Change Attitudes About LGBT Rights. And Melissa Michelson, a professor of political science at Menlo College, is here to talk about her book. Um, we'll also sp spend a few minutes at the end of the show with Kevin. Uh, so stick around for that. But first, Melissa, welcome. Thank you for being hey. back on our show. Thanks for having Always me. Always good to see you. Um, so what did you find? I mean, you, you set out to research this. Um, I know from the background I've read, that you began to wonder why this happened and why this happened with this issue and, and not others. And so you and Brian Harrison basically went off and conducted experiments around the country. Tell us a little bit about those experiments, what led you to this whole project and, and so on. Sure, so as Kevin mentioned, mostly attitudes are stable and same-sex marriage is this anomaly that attitudes shifted really very quickly and very dramatically and what was striking about it was that it wasn't just that it was cohort replacement. It wasn't just that old people with closed-minded attitudes were dying and being replaced in the population with younger people. It was people actually admitting they had changed their minds, which is really unusual. And it was across across those those lines. It wasn't distinct. In other words, older people were changing people. their positions. Exactly. Too. Yeah. People from um, all over America, all different kinds of folks were changing their mind and, and admitting to public opinion researchers that they were changing their minds. So we're like, okay, you know, we're trained political scientists. That's not normal. What the heck is going on? And we definitely think a, a big part of it is that people started realizing that they knew somebody who was a member of the gay community, right? And, and that's called contact theory. The idea that, you know, like uh, Vice President Cheney finds out that his daughter is a lesbian and then he becomes a supporter of gay rights because he loves his daughter. And while it's true that some people in that situation disown their child or stop being friends with that people who comes out to them, quite frequently, instead, the person changes their mind. So we thought that that was part of what was happening. But it was, it had to be more than that, right? Because again, it was happening too quickly too many people were changing their minds. And the theory we explored in our experiments is that it's not just somebody who is a member of the LGBTQ community coming out to you, but that it could be a member of your shared group coming out to you as a supporter. So for example, you're a fan of the Giants and maybe we're both friends of the Giants and we're talking, you know, as friends. And I say to you, hey, you know, a lot of Giants fans support gay marriage. Right? That's actually pretty similar to one of the experiments we did with Green Bay Packers fans. And we found that telling Green Bay Packers fans that a Green Bay Packer Hall of Famer, Leroy Butler, was a supporter of same-sex marriage, dramatically 
increased their support for same-sex marriage. So, so, so t talk a little bit without getting too political science-y yeah. <laughs> about the experiment itself. I mean, you're going right. around the country and essentially doing what? So it depended on which experiment it was. So there's 17 experiments in the book, and some of them were face-to-face, -face, some of them were on the phone, and some of them were online. But for example, the Green Bay Packers experiment, I hooked up with some students at Lawrence University in Appleton, Wisconsin. I used to teach there, so I still had some contacts. And the students went out on the streets of Appleton, Wisconsin with surveys. And one set of surveys had a picture of Leroy Butler on it and said that he supported same-sex marriage. And the other set of surveys had a picture of Jay-Z on them and said that Jay-Z was a supporter. And so obviously, if you're a Green Bay Packers fan, the Leroy Butler script is gonna be more appealing, right? They're both black men, they're both pretty well known, right? They're both kind of attractive, so we're holding pretty much everything constant. And then in the survey, we're also asking people if they're a Packers fan. If you're not a Packers fan, doesn't matter which script you get. But if you're a Packers fan, you're about 15 percentage points more likely to say you support same-sex marriage. Which, so which, it's astonishing. It's a huge difference. It, it, it's almost like it's a shared identity that changes attitude, basically. Exactly. And, and it, it, it's signaling to you that this is something that Green Bay Packers people do, and especially with the football experiments, and there are several of them, it's saying it's okay. But right? it's basically telling you that, that the views somebody holds on LGBTQ rights are not so deeply held that they can't be changed fairly easily, or is it? <clears throat> I think it, it's partly that people's attitudes aren't so deeply held because it doesn't really affect them. I think it's partly because they saw the trend, right? Folks consume the news in various ways and they're hearing like, hey, public opinion on this is shifting. Wow, more and more states are adopting same-sex marriage. And so part of it is also like, I want to get on that bandwagon. I want to be part of that shift in public opinion. I don't want to be left behind. And here my group is going, so I'm going to stick with my group. Right, so Can't wait to get them, on that gay bandwagon, yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but it can give some freedom or license to be uh, with that uh, prevailing uh, trend. Exactly. And I think it, it, there is something there about maybe these aren't so deep-seated feelings. It's a little bit of, I, I kind of wonder, there's a little bit of groupthink there. Um, but that shared identity piece seems at the core of this. My question was, uh, is, <clears throat> is this what you expected when you went out? Did you go out sort of suspecting that these might be the results uh, and the results then kind of supported that? Or uh, did you go in just sort of open on this and were surprised by what you found? We went in having this idea that maybe we can use opinion leaders to move public opinion and then we got to the to the identity group part of it later. Right. So we started doing experiments in 2010, and the last experiment in the book is in 2014. So we're in the field for five years. We're going all over the country, you know, Louisiana, Maryland, California, and we're doing these experiments. And you know, as we're as we're reviewing it, we're like, hmm, it's not opinion leaders. It's it's identity groups, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that's what's really moving people's attitudes. And so it. The theory kind of emerged organically from the results that we kept getting, and then we started, you know, checking that with a few more experiments to make sure we weren't just seeing what we thought we wanted to see. And, and some of the reviews were praising you for essentially field research in an area where it hadn't been done yet, uh, particularly in this area. And, and the, the, the sort of political science premise you come up with is dissonant identity priming. Right. Um, and, and what does that mean exactly? <laughs> in, in terms that pe people like me could understand. Yeah. So we've already kind of covered the identity priming thing. I'm gonna speak to you as a member of the shared religion, a member of the shared fan of sports, a member of some identity group. The, the dissonant part is based on research that shows that if I surprise you by what I'm saying, you'd be like, oh, wasn't expecting that, right? So to go back to the Green Bay Packers example, football's known as being a pretty homophobic, misogynistic sport, and so the idea that a Hall of Famer, a Packers Hall of Famer, would be for same-sex marriage. People are like, oh, wasn't expecting that. Gets their attention, kind of jolts them, right? We call it a, a cognitive speed bump. Um, <laughs> and so it, it makes more of an impression, um, makes people think about it a little bit more, right? If you're, political parties are a good way to think about it, right? If when a Democrat supports same-sex marriage, you're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But, but when a Republican, when Dick Cheney says it, when Bob Portman says it, you're like, oh, 
wasn't expecting that. Maybe Republican, you know, maybe I should rethink my thoughts about LGBT rights as a Republican, right? Because now I see these other leading Republicans. So the idea is that the dissonance actually holds more power. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And we were able to move Republicans' opinions. We couldn't really move Democrats' opinions because you can't, you can't use the identity as being a Democrat to get that dissonant jolt. But in our experiments, we were able to move Republicans' opinions, right? When Chris Christie in New Jersey pulls back on his opposition to, to same-sex marriage in New Jersey, Republicans in New Jersey can follow, but Democrats were already there. Yeah. So part of it is that there's less room, but part of it is that it's dissonant. We're gonna take a quick break. Now stick around, we'll be right back. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to The Game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. And over here we have Melissa Michelson. She's here to talk about uh, a book she co-wrote with Brian Harrison, Listen, We Need to Talk. And it's essentially exploring um, how attitudes changed about LGBT rights, and in particular, uh, prompted by the ch dramatic changes in, in less than 15 years over public opinion about same-sex marriage. And we sort of kicked off the topic with same-sex marriage. But I guess the question is, does this extend to all LGBT rights? Does it extend to, um, I don't know, every other concern they have well, about employment? Well, there's adoption rights, there's yeah. employment rights, there's rights. So there's lots of other issues. And in fact, in some of the experiments in the book, we do talk about other issues, especially because in some of the states where we went, they had already passed at the state level same-sex marriage. So for example, we went to Maryland, and by the time we were there, they had already approved same-sex marriage for, for people in Maryland. And so they wanted to know, well, how about adoption rights? How about employment non-discrimination? And so we move on to some of those, and we also moved on to support for transgender folks. But the question you didn't answer is, okay, does, it ex does, it, does yes. this extend to those rights as well? Yes, okay. although we're finding that it's a little bit trickier to move people's attitudes about transgender rights. Mm -hmm. There's more support for other LGBT rights, and the idea of this works pretty well across different areas, but people have a different reaction to transgender people, the transgender, gender non-conforming community that makes, sometimes makes attitudes more resistant because they're just kind of grossed out basically by the idea. But on the other hand, sometimes you can move attitudes really easily because people really just don't even know anything about transgender people, so their minds are fairly empty. And so you can fill them. I think open, maybe. It's open, like, yeah. let's say open. But that they don't have a lot of firm, preconceived notions about transgender people or what rights they should have. And so if you can deliver information to them and you know, give a plausible argument for supporting transgender rights, they're like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Uh, but for some people, transgender rights is really very uncomfortable. Bridge too far. Yeah. So, uh, I want to go back in time just a little bit uh, to 2000 and three, we were having a conversation. Uh, actually, our conversation on this show took place after the 2004 election where John Kerry lost to George W. Bush and there was uh, a same-sex marriage uh, 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 initiative on the ballot in Ohio and there was some thought that maybe that swung the election. Uh, and our discussion was around uh, Gavin Newsom's actions as the mayor of San Francisco and the role that that may have played in the results of the 2004 election. And, you know, I was commenting, I think that, look, he's on the right side of history, but timing does matter. And at that moment, it felt like maybe that had helped tip the presidential election in favor of George W. Bush in 2004. But going back to that action and sort of those high profiles, defiant actions that generate a lot of media attention, 
just your opinion, do those kinds of things, were those turning point moments as we look back in history where these things become very visible and get a lot of exposure and a lot of attention in the media that maybe previously they hadn't had? And what kind of role does that play in how people perceive uh, these things? And any just thoughts you have as, as a astute observer of all of this over, over the last decade or so? Yeah, it, I think it really does make a difference. And although we weren't in the field early enough to test the effect of Gavin Newsom's leadership on it, we were out in the field when Barack Obama evolved his position, and we found that it had massive effects on black public opinion. This is something that was of concern to a couple of the groups that we worked with, and a lot of these experiments were in cooperation with LGBTQ advocacy organizations. And multiple organizations were concerned that black Americans tended to be much less supportive. <clears throat> and they wanted to be able to, to move attitudes forward. So we were already working with them on that. And then Barack Obama famously, right, with a little nudge from Joe Biden, comes out in May 2012 in support in an election year, but before the election, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And there was concern at the time that this would lead black Americans to stay home because now they would abandon their president because he had abandoned them mm -hmm. on this issue. But instead, they followed the president. They changed their minds. Poll after poll showed that black public opinion switched. And when we did an experiment on that and we randomly told black Americans, hey, Barack Obama's a supporter, that totally made a difference. Yeah. So, so, it, so people follow these high profile switches. Um, it, you know, it provides this opportunity to jump on the opinion bandwagon and, and to cement their identity and say, this, this is where black America is. I'm go, you know, this is my group and I'm gonna be with it. So to Kevin's point, you can't underestimate the impact of a message, whether well, it's these delivered. elite messages. Yeah, but but even in the case of Gavin Newsom, you know, <clears throat> it's it's gonna you know it's here. It's never going away, which really upset a lot of people. And and but maybe it's it's part of the process of okay that year maybe it did have that impact, but it paved the way for what, what Obama did some years later. Absolutely. So I, I think that sort of leadership from people, even when they take hits for it, right. Um, that that really does help move public opinion. It's it's leadership on on I issues that you know maybe in the short term hurt you, but that's the kind of thing that moves the nation forward. D does it work on race? I mean, this is really the critical question. Does it work on other issues, yeah. or do we just not know yet? And in is there something specifically unique about LGBT uh, rights and individuals? that makes this work, that may, it, it may be applicable, it may not be. That's really the yeah. political science question, isn't so, it? So last year, or earlier this year, Brian and I went on, a, no, not last year, sorry, on a national tour, actually. We toured the country, we spoke to multiple campuses about the book, and a lot of younger faculty and graduate students are like, oh, I'm gonna try to use that to move attitudes on climate change, I'm gonna try to use that on abortion. And so far, it seems like it doesn't work so much on things like abortion, Right, because people's attitudes about abortion are pretty firm, um, but that there that there are ways in which it can be used to move attitudes on other issues. So I think it's the answer is it depends. <laughs> how firmly are those attitudes held? How much are those attitudes linked to that person's sense of self? Right, if your position on abortion is really an important part of who you are, then all the nudges in the world aren't gonna. Right? All the cognitive speed bumps in the world aren't going to move you. It doesn't matter if it's a newer, you know, gay rights is a relatively new issue compared to abortion. So, so maybe the lines didn't yes, have an opportunity exactly. to harden in quite the same way. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So I was just going to ask, <clears throat> and you touched on this with the, the questions around race, but any historical parallels for having public opinion move so dramatically and so rapidly, or is this really uh, really anomalous uh, looking back in terms of public issues in this country? Well, there's one contemporary issue that's very relevant to today. We're taping mm -hmm. on 420. Attitudes about the legalization of marijuana also have moved dramatically um, and become much more supportive in a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. But really, those are the only two that I know of where attitudes have moved so quickly on an issue that's very contentious. and and where we might have thought like, well, that's, that's just what people think. You can't change people's minds. Mm -hmm. these, these are both very unusual. And that's why Brian and I started doing this research because we're like, wait, this is not normal, right? This is the anomaly. So now we have two anomalies. Yeah. Somebody else should write a book about the shift on marijuana legalization, but it's, yeah. it's stunningly different than anything else we've ever seen. And does any of this get at the issue of 
government intrusion. So as a progressive Democrat myself, I, I kind of get why we would be there on those issues around same-sex marriage and marijuana legalization, but there's a libertarian streak to the Republican Party which doesn't like government getting uh, in the business of how people conduct themselves in the bedroom or uh, getting into the way they uh, live their lives. Uh, so is there uh, sort of a, a, a marriage there of folks who don't like government intrusion, big government, and sort of the progressives in this country, or is that a little too simple and too much of a shortcut politically? It's a compelling theory, but I don't have any data. Yeah. So like maybe, yeah, but um, the right there are, there's definitely segments of folks who identify as Republicans and maybe those are the libertarians who have changed their attitudes about both of those issues over time. Okay, we're gonna have to take another break. Okay. Stick around, we'll be right back. We'll be back with more data. <laughs> <laughs> It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back to the game. I'm Mark Simon. He's Kevin Mullen. Professor Mel Melissa Michelson is here to talk about her book, Listen, We Need to Talk, Changing Attitudes About LGBT Rights. Um, you reference breaking through the bubble. Um, what does that mean? That there's a way to get past the prior conversation? Or does it mean breaking people out of the sort of where they are and what they've been doing their whole lives? It means that Usually you have some beliefs, some opinions, and... Although, although they're up for grabs. Well, <laughs> most people are pretty resistant to receiving information that is not agreeing, right? They're gonna say, fake news, not true, right? Um, and so whatever's on TV or in the paper, they just reject it as not true. And so how do you break through that and get people to listen to what you're saying that's where this identity priming comes from in the book, in our, in our theory, is that you're making the connection with somebody, like, hey, we're, on the, we're in the same group here, we're parts of the same tribe. And so that opens up people to listen to you, that, that lets them through that wall that you've put up around yourself and your attitudes where you don't wanna hear anything that makes you have to rethink who you are or what you think. Mm -hmm. So once, you get, once, once somebody gets in there, obviously you have a much better chance of changing their mind. So it's, it's not just throwing information about people or telling them that they're wrong or telling them that they're bigots. It's making a connection with people and, you know, and establishing that you are like them, that you are members of the same group, and then giving them the information that's intended to be persuasive. So we have, we're running short on time here. I think congratulations is in order. I saw something on Facebook last night about a Dean something or other. What I happened? won the Dean's Scholarship Award. Uh, from Menlo College, thank you, last night at our honors convocation. So I've had a good year. I wrote a couple books, published some stuff. And you kickstarted this project. <laughs> why, why That's you, true. Why did you do it that way? Well, Menlo College is a small place, um, and we were running out of research money to do the experiments, and so Brian and I had this idea. Let's run a Kickstarter campaign, and we'll just get people to give us money. And it worked. We raised like $11,000 oh, on Kickstarter, right? Which is adorable. I mean, my parents gave, our siblings gave, but then like complete strangers gave us money too. So it was awesome. Could be opening up a whole new career for you. Melissa Michelson, thank you so much for being here. <laughs> Thanks, Stick guys. around. We're going to have a few minutes with Kevin. Uh, stay, stick around. That's what I meant. I said it. I meant it. It's been over 150 years since Wells Fargo first opened for business. Since then, we've enjoyed your community support and we're passionate about returning it. Every day, Wells Fargo team members roll up their sleeves and donate their time to organizations and charitable groups throughout the Bay Area. Nationally, we've committed even more. 
In just the past two years alone, we've donated over $70 million to support schools and educational programs. It's a commitment we're proud of. Wells Fargo, the next stage. Welcome back. We're spending a few minutes with Kevin Mullen, Assemblyman Kevin Mullen. Um, we all saw and watched all the controversy over Facebook, and there's just been an ongoing controversy over the manipulation of social media. Who's doing it? it? Turns out a lot of times we don't know. And so you're trying to tackle that issue. Well, the, the slice of this, honestly, that we're getting at, there are larger issues around how uh, personal information and, and privacy protections work on social media. The piece of this that, that I'm dealing with is something called the Social Media Disclose Act. It's a follow-up to legislation, landmark uh, legislation we were, we were able to get done up number of colleagues <clears throat> of mine around disclosing the true funders behind campaign advertisements. There's always been a, a, a disclosure requirement, but from a formatting standpoint, you'll be able to see it is in this like election. It's like Friends of a Better California or something right, like that. Right, those phony they? committee names. We're actually requiring on TV and radio ads right now, this year in this election, who the actual people are behind those uh, uh, funds that, that buy those TV and radio ads. This extends that to social media because so much money is moving into Facebook and Twitter. As we learned, there was $100,000 in, in ads bought uh, by Russian entities in the 2016 election without identification. So this is going to really change the way uh, uh, disclosure works on political advertising on social media. Fortunately, Facebook has come to the table and they're working with us. We want to make sure that tech a lot, technically it works uh, in that, that stream, the news feed uh, on Facebook, so uh, you can see who's really trying to influence your vote. So that's really a, a, a big thing we're working on this year, but the timing is good because these social media companies realize they need to step up and do better in terms of privacy protections, but also disclosing how money is moving and how your vote is trying to be uh, uh, influenced uh, on those platforms. We're, we're running out of time, but as a lifetime lover of politics, yeah. are you worried about what's happening to our, our system? Are you worried that it's being influenced and buffeted about by in, interests and in people we don't even Absolutely, and uh, my largest concern, I think, is public uh, distrust of large institutions and the political system itself feels broken, and that's a topic for another day. But our democracy is not only under attack, but uh, there are tremendous divisions within that we need to heal and we need to fix uh, because I think people are truly frustrated that progress isn't being made on some of the really big challenges we have in the country. Kevin, thank you for a few minutes with you. I'm Mark Simon. And I'm Kevin Mullen. Thank you for being with us and join us next time on The Game.